probably it's a good time to start. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am Valery Yakubovich, Executive Director of the Mac Institute for Innovation Management. Uh, as many of you know, um, we actually focus on research on innovation driven by uh, disruptive technologies. And uh, the main technology which we are talking about today is generative AI. It creates a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of anxiety. I think it's also a good topic to discuss at Wharton because in fact, uh, about a hundred years ago, when it was the first wave of uh, automation, Friedrich Taylor, who tried to optimize many manual jobs at that time, actually had his time and motion studies lab um, pretty much on, uh, on, on campus, uh, where Wharton uh, Steinberg Dietrich Hall is located now. So um, another good reason, maybe the most important reason to do it here is that we have quite interesting research at Wharton on the topic of generative AI and jobs. Some of it is done uh, at the Center for Human Resources, the first research center at, the University, uh, at Wharton and the University of Pennsylvania, uh, led by uh, Peter Capelli, who is one of our presenters today. And um, actually, uh, the center itself is a co-sponsor of our event. Um, as I mentioned already, we'll talk about uh, the implications of generative AI for jobs. Uh, and uh, we'll have three panelists. Uh, we'll start with, in addition to Peter Capelli, it's uh, uh, Manaf Raj from the management department and Daniel Rock from the department of uh, operations, information and decisions. We'll start with their 10 minute presentations, opening statements, and then follow up with a general discussion and your questions. Please uh, post your questions in advance in our Q&A section. That uh, button should be available to you. So that's without any further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker. Uh, it's uh, Manav Raj, uh, Assistant Professor of Management at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. His research uh, studies how firms respond to innovation and technological disruption with a focus on digital platforms and technologies. And his second topic of interest is institutional features and non-market forces that affect innovation and entrepreneurship. Prior to getting his PhD from NYU, he worked as a consultant with Cornerstone Research in Boston. Please, Manav, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Valeri. Um, I'm just sharing my slides. I'm assuming you guys can see that all right. Um, Great, so I'll go ahead and get started. So today, you know, I'm excited to be here and to have the opportunity to share some of my research with you with you all um, and kick us off on this conversation. So, you know, the, the research that I'll be sharing with you guys is about some of the, the work I've done to try and identify occupational exposure to AI and to generative AI and to then look at heterogeneity in which populations may be more or less exposed to these technologies. So. Uh, this research is something that I've been working on, a line of work that kind of started a few years ago, perhaps before the boom of interest in generative AI. Uh, I was talking to some of my co-authors about the idea that, you know, AI seems like a transformational technology, but one of the challenges that's out there is that it's hard to measure what exactly is going on in the space, particularly because it is so new. So part of our goal was to try and create a methodology and a measure that we could use to understand which occupations may be more or less exposed to these technologies. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you guys through at a really high level uh, what our methodology looks like before showing you some of what these results look like. And we can kind of talk through together uh, which of these occupations look more or less exposed to AI and then generative AI specifically. So when we were trying to think about how to measure exposure to AI, where we wanted to start was to think about the use cases, how the fundamental use cases or applications of AI that we might expect to show up in the workplace. So we started with data from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that was housed out of Stanford to give us a list of some of these applications. And you can see some of them up on the slides here, things like image recognition, image generation, uh, importantly, language modeling all show up here. Uh, we take these lists of applications and then we connect them to occupational abilities. Uh, so these abilities come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They have a list of what they call 52 
kind of fundamental abilities within an occupation. And so these abilities take a wide range of forms. Some of them are very physical. So things like trunk strength show up, hand-eye coordination in different ways. Uh, some of them are more cognitive or perceptual. So things related to decision-making. What we did is we used a crowdsourced data set uh, constructed using you know, nearly 2000 survey responses to connect each of these occupational abilities to these applications of AI. So you can see what these questions look like here. Fundamentally, what we were asking people were yes or no questions regarding whether and to, whether they felt uh, an application of AI was related to an occupational ability. Uh, kind of aggregated up across all the participants, what this allowed us to do was create this kind of matrix that linked, you could imagine the 52 abilities that we're getting from the Bureau of Labor Statistics on one side of the matrix and these different AI categories or applications on the other side of the matrix. And within each cell, we were getting some sort of measure that was telling us how connected each application was to each occupational ability. With that, we were able to leverage data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that gave us occupational definitions that told us how important each of these abilities were within an occupation. So you can see an example for chief executives here. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, manual dexterity and arm hand steadiness are extremely unimportant for a chief executive. You can see that they have values of zero, whereas skills such as deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning or problem sensitivity are considered very important. Uh, so using the relative weight of abilities across occupations, uh, along with this ability level uh, metric of AI exposure we constructed previously, we're able to generate an occupation level of AI exposure. And so just to show you what this looks like with uh, the general data that we constructed, these are the highest and lowest scoring occupations using our methodology. Uh, in the high scoring occupations, you'll see a lot of what we consider white collar occupations. So genetic counselors are number one, financial examiners number two, actuaries number three. In the lowest scoring occupations, we see a lot of occupations that are relatively heavily weighted on physical abilities. Uh, so dancers, uh, fitness trainers and aerobics instructors, uh, reinforcing iron and rebar workers all show up very highly on the lowest scoring list. Fundamentally, this is capturing what our methodology is doing here. We are basically identifying occupations that have a relatively high proportion of abilities that could be exposed to AI. And you know, when we are talking about AI in our methodology, we are thinking purely artificial intelligence, not necessarily smart robotics or things that incorporate some of these more physical abilities, which is why we see you know, occupations with higher weightings of physical abilities showing up on the lowest scoring list. Uh, and what does pop up on the highest scoring list are occupations that rely a lot on perceptual abilities and pattern matching uh, in cognitive information processing. Those tend to be the highest scoring occupations because those are the one, those are those abilities that are most exposed to advances in artificial intelligence. Now, just to give you guys a little bit of a sense of validation of this measure, uh, one thing that we did is we took job posting data. Uh, we use data from Burning Glass Technologies, their data vendor that scrapes data on all online job posts. And we evaluate the relative presence of AI skills in these job posts with our occupational exposure scores. And while this is noisy, what we see is a strong uh, positive and statistically significant correlation between our exposure scores and the average count of AI skills in a job listing. So we think this is a relatively good proof of concept. Um, I would be happy to kind of talk more about some of the other validation we do, uh, but for the sake of time, I want to move forward about talking about how we applied this to the generative AI context. One of the nice things about our methodology, we think, is it's relatively flexible. Uh, we can update the inputs as these different technologies advance or as occupational definitions change and the scope of abilities within an occupation change. Uh, we've done things like take this to the from the occupation level to the industry level. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about what that looks like during the Q&A. But in the recent months, one thing that was really exciting for us is that our methodology allows us to isolate specific categories of AI. Uh, and, you know, in the, the last year or so, there has been a lot of interest in language modeling, uh, artificial intelligence, and more broadly thinking about generative AI rather than discriminative AI. And so what we did with our, with our methodology is we focused on those applications, uh, the generative AI applications, so language modeling and image generation. And we looked to see uh, which occupations are most exposed to specifically advances in those kinds of artificial intelligence. 
Uh, again, same methodology as before, but just showing you the top 20 list of most exposed occupations for language modeling and image generation. Uh, one thing that we think is nice is that we think this passes you know, a sanity check. Uh, when we look at the language modeling measure, the most exposed occupations tend to be occupations that rely heavily on communication and verbal skills. So uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, telemarketers are our most exposed occupation when it comes to language modeling exposure. Uh, we see a lot of post-secondary education, so uh, those make up a good chunk of the top 20 occupations. And, uh, you know, as a professor myself and as someone working in, in post-secondary education, I think this is something that me and many of my colleagues know to be true. Um, you know, we've had many, many conversations around, you know, teaching and grading and assignments and trying to adapt to the new world around us. And I think there are opportunities to use these tools in the classroom and for creating classroom materials as well. Uh, when we look at the image generation scores, again, unsurprisingly, what we see is that uh, abilities more tied to image generation around visualization, uh, around graphic understanding seem to pop up more heavily here. So number one, uh, most exposed to image generation are interior designers and then architects. So again, we, we think the sanity check matches up here and the you know, emphasis that we would put, you know, as a takeaway from looking at these is that by thinking about the abilities that make up an occupation, we may have a better sense of who may be more or less exposed to these changes. Now, the one thing that is kind of nice that we can do with these uh, exposure scores is also use them to explore characteristics of the populations that are more or less exposed. So one thing that we've done is we've just tried to correlate our exposure scores with different occupational characteristics. So if we track the exposure scores with the median salary in these occupations, what we see is that uh, AI exposure, at least uh, as we're measuring it, is positively correlated with median salary. It also appears to be positively correlated with required levels of education and with the presence of creative abilities within an occupation. And so, you know, one thing to highlight here, especially relative to previous technologies that have you know, threatened automation or that have had people worried about job loss or things like that, these seem to be targeted towards a different kind of worker. Um, this is not blue collar work that we expect to be most exposed. It's white collar work, what we might consider high skill labor. Uh, we can also take this to different demographic characteristics. So we looked at the exposure to generative AI uh, in the male representation of employees within an occupation. We see a negative relationship. Of course, the inverse with female representation. And we can see this with different uh, racial or ethnic groups as well. So we see a positive correlation between the representation of white employment exposure, generative AI, uh, and for Asian representation as well, uh, negative relationship between black representation and exposure to generative AI and Hispanic representation. Uh, and we think these are important to show just in the sense that, you know, if we're thinking about the policy implications and how the government should be preparing for these kind of changes, uh, one thing that we want to do is make sure that no one is left behind by these new technologies and that we're putting in place policies that help reskill workers and are targeted towards those who may be more or less affected. So, you know, when we're, we're thinking about our research, we're joining, you know, other work that's out there, including work by Daniel, who's going to be talking a little bit later about the idea that these tools may eventually have a large impact. So research by Daniel and people at OpenAI uh, suggests that you know, language modelers are general purpose technologies that could affect a lot of people. Uh, we've seen kind of similar evidence in other settings that AI will affect high skill tasks and that the demographic patterns we're showing uh, have been validated by research institutions like Pew. But just to kind of summarize what I think we can take away from this work itself, you know, what we're saying is that this is some understanding of who may be more or less exposed to or affected by generative AI. To caveat this, though, this does not tell us at all. This is not a list of the top 20 jobs that are most likely to be you know, destroyed by AI, and, and especially in the short term. You know, what we are what we are measuring in this exposure score tells us where we should look to see where the effects show up. And it may take a while for these effects to show up. They may show up as augmentation. They may show up as productivity improvement. And we think that is really the value here. It is a tool for us to identify who should be preparing the most and where we should be looking to see these effects and to also eventually measure the effects of AI across occupations to understand when we may see more of this automation, more of this augmentation uh, and how we can uh, react accordingly. Uh, so that is all I have. I'll stop sharing now. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Peter and Daniel talk as well. Thank you. Thank you, Manav. Um, 
So now we are uh, moving to the second presentation by Professor Peter Capelli. Uh, Peter Capelli is the George W. Taylor Professor of Management at the Wharton School and Director of the Center for Human Resources. He is also a research associate at the National Bureau for Economic Research and a fellow of the National Academy of Human Resources, as well as a recipient of multiple uh, honorary degrees and awards. His research on uh, recruitment and hiring, performance management, and other HR topics has appeared in major academic uh, publications and uh, mass media outlets. Uh, thank you, Peter, for being with us. It's your turn. Good. Uh, thank you, Valeri. Thank you, everyone. Nice to have you with us. You know, I was just thinking that about 30 years ago, I was on one of the committees that created the ONET for the U.S. Department of Labor that Manaj was just using. And I remember thinking at the time, who's ever going to use this? And poof, um, there it is. So nice to see Manaj is, uh, is using that. That's a good thing to see. Uh, let me put my slides up here, and I'm hoping you can all see them. Somebody give me a thumbs up if you can, uh, just to make sure, or an oral yes, um, because yes, yes, there you go. Um, so let's jump into these slides. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the question which gets the most attention uh, around ChatGBT and these large language models of generative AI, and that is, will they lead to substantial job losses. And just to back up to what Manav was saying, uh, it, it is important to know who might be affected by these, even if you don't think they're going to lose their jobs. Uh, but that's the big question, is are they going to lose their jobs or not? Rather than keep you in suspense any longer, uh, here's my view on this. No. Uh, pretty simple. No. <laughs> and just to put this in a little perspective, I'd like us to pause for a minute and ask ourselves why the forecasts about artificial intelligence over the last decade have been not only wrong, but spectacularly wrong, right? So maybe the most obvious one is the forecasts about driverless cars and driverless trucks. You may recall by 2019, um, there were lots of reports, particularly consultant reports, saying that we're gonna have to do something about all these unemployed truck drivers because it's very clear that driverless trucks are going to take their jobs. Um, and of course, it didn't. It didn't take, as far as I can tell, a single job. It was a spectacularly wrong um, forecast. Much the same forecasts have been made over the last generation for robots. And to the extent that we have evidence about the effects of robots in particular workplaces, they're mainly augmenting the tasks that individual employees can do. They aren't even designed to replace individual employees. And more recently, uh, the arguments about what machine learning can do, which I think I could, we could argue is even more useful for employers right now than um, large language models are, uh, have been remarkably disappointing. Uh, Valeria and I and Sunny Tamby have written about that. And we've actually written about this topic as well, although I don't want to blame them for anything that I'm going to say because um, they haven't blessed this. Um, so let me tell you why I think the forecasts have been so wrong. I think there's two reasons. One is a more general issue, and that is if you're in the consulting business, you don't make points and it doesn't help you to say nothing to see here, everything is fine, or we have no idea yet. Um, in fact, it helps you to make extreme predictions. We know this for economic forecasts, which is why um, the experts always tell you is the average of forecasts. Don't take any individual person's forecast because there's very little downside. Nobody remembers if you get them wrong. Uh, and if you happen to hit one right and you're extreme, boo, you get a lot of attention. Uh, the consulting firms have a great practice of taking down their reports off their websites as soon as it's clear they're spectacularly wrong, as they often are. And my sense is the forecasts about ChatGBT and uh, LLMs in general are also spectacularly wrong. Um, but let's talk about why. The reason has to do with the assumption in most of these uh, forecasts, which are generated by the people who build the technology at the beginning, uh, is that if 
something could be done with AI, it will be done. And the way it's being done now will just disappear. Um, and if you understand a bit about how jobs are organized and how work is structured, you can see why that simply isn't the case. So let's talk about this for a minute. By the way, this image was generated by Microsoft's Wally visual image AI generator. It's kind of weird, but uh, don't blame me. I thought I would put it there just to tell you what AI thinks AI looks like. And there you go. Uh, at the very beginning of this, it's important to remember that if we're thinking about something that will replace jobs, it's only going to replace jobs if that innovation is replacing a task that we're currently performing. If it's doing something in addition that we're not doing now, if it's generating, let's say, research reports that we're not generating now, it's not going to cut jobs. It might improve productivity. That could be a great thing. Um, but that doesn't mean that it will cut jobs. You got to cut tasks out, things we're currently doing, in order to improve productivity. Productivity is not the only measure we should care about, of course. Uh, but that's something to keep in mind. The other thing to know about these reports from and answers that come from prompts to chat GBT and the other large language models is you have to decide how good are they? So with machine learning algorithms, you can tell because they're making prediction devices, you know, predictions, you can see how good they are. Um, with these outputs, you have to decide how good is it? You know, when our students are using this to produce term papers, and by the way, term papers may be the ideal product for large language models. Uh, and the reason is because term papers just have to be kind of good enough. They don't have to be perfect. The reports and the term papers that these large language models produce are not perfect. They're not great. They're kind of good enough. They're good enough to get you kind of a B plus. And if you're asking them to produce a letter for you or response to a customer, you could pretty easily tell whether it's good enough or not. I can tell you if I'm trying to write a memo to my boss, I don't want ChatGBT to write it because I want to be able to refer to some pretty specific things. I want to be kind of funny, but not too funny. I want to be funny in a way that I think they'll understand. You know, the act of writing can be quite subtle. And so far, I don't think these large language models will be able to mimic the way in which I want to be subtle, audience by audience by audience. So there are things that ChatGBT can write that I don't want to have them write for me, even though what they might do is kind of pretty good because there are contexts where I want it to be really good. The other thing to remember is that there are lots of jobs that are doing things that we think ChatGBT could do now. Simple correspondence, for example, you know, responding to customers, those sorts of things. But it's important to remember that a lot of those jobs, and I would say most of them, are already automated. We use chatbots to deal with customer questions. We have form letters. Software is already in place for almost all call centers that provide the answers for the call center employees. So the question to ask yourself is, do we think ChatGBT will do an even better job than these do? Well, they might, but remember that most businesses could already provide better customer service than they do. They just don't want to pay for it. And so they don't think it's worthwhile. So do we think it's going to happen that companies will replace their chatbots, put in place large language models instead? Is it worth it for them? Uh, and that's not the least bit obvious. Uh, so where we're going to see the most use out of these large language models is when you have to write something which is not so standard that it's already been automated. And these are assignments which are more novel, questions which are not just asked all the time in a repetitive way, like writing a report that we haven't done before. Most employees don't do that very often. Even the employees who write a lot are not necessarily writing unusual novel assignments, have questions that you know are kind of one-off. 
Uh, and that's true for white, most white collar jobs. They don't do it very often. And that's an issue if you think it might eliminate jobs because you can't easily cut 10% of an employee. So let's say we conclude that 10% of this job involves writing responses like that. Well, if it happened that they did them all in the month of January, that might be useful. But if you can't predict when they're going to be doing them, it's hard to cut back on what they do. Here's an example. Let's say you're talking about a school principal. Wouldn't surprise me at all if about 10% of what principals currently do could be done by Chet GBT. Okay. Um, so let's say it was a third of what they did. Are you going to cut a principals from a third of all schools, you're not, because every school is still going to need a principal unless you get to the point where chat GBT can do most everything. It's not going to eliminate those jobs. So you might say, well, what are those folks going to be doing instead? Most all white collar employees now report they're swamped with stuff to do. So they could otherwise find other things to do. It doesn't mean their job's going to be eliminated. The situation where you could expect jobs to be eliminated are those where the work is organized like an old fashioned typing pool, which most of you probably never saw, uh, but a typing pool used to be a, a literal physical area where a bunch of typists were sitting and typing tasks would come in one at a time and they would allocate them to individual typists. And then if another one came in, they'd give it to the next typist who wasn't busy. And if all of those typists were fully occupied and we got a innovation like selectric typewriters where you could type a lot faster. Let's say that we had a 10% improvement in productivity. You could rearrange those tasks so that you had one person with nothing to do and you could get rid of that person, right? But it requires that kind of work organization. And by the way, that type of work organization is absolutely terrible for motivation, for work quality, for employee engagement and everything else. But that's the kind of work organization that you would need, people doing identical tasks in big pools where their work is interchangeable. That's where you could easily cut people out. Otherwise, you can't. So let's talk about some famous examples of this. Let's start with medicine. Diagnostic software. Could ChatGBT right now generate diagnoses of patients if you give it the right information? Certainly could. That software has been around for a long time now. And what has happened with it? Well, nothing. First, because doctors don't want to use it, even though it probably works pretty good. Uh, but the second thing is it's not productivity improving because once a doctor gets all the test scores, which is the same thing ChatGBT would have to wait for, once they get all those, then they make the decisions very quickly. So it's not saving any time. ATMs, you probably know when they were introduced, that led to no reduction in bank tellers. And the reason is we found other things that bank tellers could use usefully do that was more useful than what they were doing before, which was just writing, you know, taking checks from people and handing them cash. Right. And as Larry mentioned earlier, LLMs and using them generate a lot of new tasks that we haven't paid attention to and somebody's got to do. Uh, like setting guardrails, that means what data you are going to allow this to be trained on. We don't want wacko stuff. Uh, to be part of the answer it's going to generate for us. Uh, to be really useful, we need to have our own proprietary company data in it. You have to load that in and protect it. Uh, you have to check for errors once the report is out. Does it make any sense? Or was the software hallucinating? You have to decide whether the answer is good enough. And something we haven't thought enough about, it's effectively costless to generate more reports. So, you know, the company generates a report on the business opportunities in China. I don't like that report because it affects my part of the business. So I generate my own report and I give it to the CEO. Now they've got two or three reports that are on identical questions that have very different answers because LLMs are not robust on that aspect. You can ask the same one, the same question, different points in time, and you get different answers. You ask different LLMs, you get very different answers to the identical questions. And the last thing to remember is this is not going to be free for long. This is a prediction I will make <laughs> because it's really expensive to build these. It's really expensive to run them. Somebody's got to pay for that. And just the last question, if 
you are in one of these jobs, you probably should be worried. And this is if you're doing gig work, because we can cut back 10% of you, of your time and your hours anyway. If you're in a pool, particularly of computer programmers, all doing identical work, we could probably cut that back. Uh, this one is maybe the most surprising. It appears that a lot of individuals are happier being coached by LLMs than by a human, at least initially, because it's not embarrassing. You don't have to confess things to a human. I struggle with this problem, you can tell an LLM, and that seems to be an opportunity that we would have never anticipated uh, from simple kind of uh, looking at the task requirements of jobs and what LLMs can do. Visual artists, same problem there. Graders, as Manav kind of indicated, you got problems there. But in general, we have to think pretty carefully before we make predictions. My prediction, though, is going to be what we're hearing so far is probably way overblown in terms of the likely effects on jobs. Thank you, Peter. Um, so the stage is set, right? We have kind of a lot of exposure potentially, but uh, uh, as Peter argues, very little of this might actually materialize. Uh, I guess, Daniel, it's your turn to uh, kind of try to adjudicate here and maybe introduce <laughs> additional points we, or conditions we should keep in mind. Uh, yeah, I'll, well, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Just let me introduce you briefly. Uh, Daniel Roth is our next uh, presenter. He is assistant professor um, of operations, information, and decisions at the Wharton School. His research is focused exactly on this topic, economics, economic implications of artificial intelligence. Uh, and it's been published in a number of uh, academic uh, outlets, as well as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and other uh, mass media publications. Uh, he received his uh, degrees, bachelor degree from Wharton, actually then went for master's and PhDs for, uh, to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And now he's back as our faculty member here. Please welcome, Danny. Thanks very much. Um, it's a pleasure to get to share some ideas with you guys and to, to have some discussion about this stuff. Um, you know, my short answer is that I pretty much agree with everything that both Manav and Peter already said, um, including the, uh, you know, you should be worried if you're a grader. I've already automated certain aspects of that for my class. So, um, you know, if anyone wants that code and happens to be teaching people, let me know. I just don't tell my students I actually still grade things manually out of interest. All right. So um, I want to provide like a little bit of a, a big picture macro uh, perspective on when we might see the impact of these technologies. Though I 100% agree that this uh, relentless focus on automation, wholesale automation of work seems to be very much misplaced. So this is something that keeps coming back, um, you know, even since the, the 80s, uh, the productivity paradox of information technology. You know, in 1987, Bob Solo said, basically you see computer, uh, the computer age everywhere, but in the productivity statistics. And of course, famously, it did show up um, in the productivity statistics. It just took some time. So I want to talk about, a little bit about where that might come from. Right now, we see amazing new technologies being developed. There's lots of cause for optimism. You've got Bill Gates saying innovation is moving at a scarily fast pace. Um, you know, Paul Pullman uh, Unilever said something similar. You know, Kosla uh, heard him once say at a conference that nobody would be working at all uh, within 15 years. I think he's got seven years left on that prediction. Um, we're still working quite a lot. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're entering this age of abundance and this is the new age of intelligence where we've got commodified intelligence. So, you know, Eric Schmidt said that kind of stuff. So how do we square that with the disappointing recent reality that pretty much everywhere, at least, you know, until the most recent quarter, but I don't know how much you want to index on that. Um, you know, we're more than a decade into a productivity growth slowdown pretty much worldwide. Um, the U.S. is doing a little bit better than other places, um, but, you know, for the U.S. Uh, context, we were growing at 2.8% a year in terms of productivity. That is, you could think of it broadly as the ratio of output to inputs. Um, and then since, you know, 2005, it's been around one and a quarter percent uh, per year. Now, the pandemic definitely bounced things around a little bit. So, you know, that's that's a pretty major slowdown. And if you consider intangible assets 
uh, along with it, it might be even bigger. Of course, the levels shift up if you consider intangible assets too. So maybe we were growing at three and a half percent and then we slowed down to like 1.8% or so. You know, about 29 of 30 countries saw similar slowdowns. Now, if you'll permit me a little bit of chart crime for a second here, um, something similar happened with portable power. So this is like the electrification movement. Um, we start from, you know, 1890 or so, we look up through 1930, there's a slowdown. IT, uh, a few index things similarly, kind of follows a similar path. Um, and then portable power did this, and we see this ramping up. So, which isn't to say, you know, we had these benefits and now they're definitely gone. It, or, uh, now we're for sure going to get this, this great benefit, I should say, but um, it's possible that, that things ramp up. So we have to think about where these different explanations for that paradox come from. One is that, you know, it's false hopes. This stuff just isn't as good as everybody's saying it is, even if it can do some remarkable things like write essays for us. And I think there's, there's some basis for that. There's also a Silicon Valley explanation that we just mismeasured stuff, um, but nothing's changed in terms of our measurement. And that would be necessary if we really wanted to blame mismeasurement um, for, for slowing things down. Um, there's also an argument that's occasionally made that yes, the gains are real, but it's only a really small group of people who benefit from it. I think that small group of people benefiting from it have to get absolutely enormous gains for this to dissipate. So that one's kind of prima facie doesn't have the best case. And then my preferred explanation, which we do see some evidence for that the implementation and restructuring takes a really long time and you have to change a lot. You have to think about job design in particular and systems of jobs, how you design them uh, to get the gains from these new technologies. So, um, oops, uh, I don't know why this is, uh, oh, okay, these are, whoops. So what my, my colleagues and I, just to skip ahead, um, that's the discussion of those four things. Well, we, we call this phenomenon the productivity J-curve. And what that means is that um, in the beginning, as you start to uh, want to implement something like Gen AI, something that's super impactful, you have to put a lot of real observable resources, investment, um, labor time, all you know, capital into creating something that's very difficult to measure, which is a new business process or a new firm design um, this is where startups can often eat the lunch of incumbents, but then it looks like you're putting in more to get less out because the, the output of that is this intangible asset um, that sits within companies or organizations. But then later on, as that intangible asset starts to generate a yield, it looks like you're getting something, something real in exchange for nothing because that asset isn't on the input side. So while the initial upfront investment may be quite large and deep, and it looks like a drag on productivity, longer term, the gains are going to be there. So we've seen that dynamic show up for computer hardware, um, for R&D, which is now stabilizing the share of the economy. And for software, it really has never stopped. People are still pumping more and more into intangible asset creation than we're getting as a, as a yield uh, on the economy. So to return to the question about Gen AI, like what are we actually seeing? Well, to back up what Manav was saying, is, and he mentioned a little bit about this. So my uh, co-authors and I found something similar, that it's the highest wage workers that are most exposed. Um, but that, you know, to Peter's point about, you know, you, do you have lots of people doing the same work and like a pool structure, exposure to Gen AI isn't really correlated with like how many people are doing um, the job at any one point in time. There's some jobs where it's sort of bespoke, some jobs where it's all very similar, you know, the customer service application being the most prominent in recent days. But what we do see is that across the different types of exposure, whether you're going to need additional systems or you're just exposed with large language models on your own, if you look at the level of exposure at the task level, right? So going within the job to like the 20 or 30 things that people do, um, most of the time, large language models can't even take out, you know, say 40% of what people are doing. So we are limited to reorganizing how people spend their time if you're just looking at large language models. Now, where you might see more transformational change is when large language models interact with other types of software and we require that additional complementary innovation. That's what can deepen the J-curve and why we might expect this to take a long period of time. Now, if I'm excited about one thing with large language models, and if there's one takeaway to be had with this, like where is the additional investment going to pay off? It's that tech workers, researchers, uh, scientists, 
and um, and teachers are some of the most exposed in terms of their task content to large language models. And that means we can ask new types of research questions, expand the set of tasks or pe that people are doing, um, and really like start to build new technologies that have downstream cascading effects in terms of productivity for all sorts of different types of workers. Um, this network shows it's a bunch of jobs connecting connected by the activities they share. I'm sorry. Um, what we find is that there's about 11 different clusters and it's that human capital intensive cluster in particular, the people who get paid a lot, but the people come up with new ideas, especially, they're the ones with the greatest levels of exposure. And we're not talking about removing their jobs, no, quite the contrary. Uh, we're talking about expanding what they can do and having them potentially drive major gains throughout all sectors of the economy. So we call this, uh, you know, in this paper, we call it uh, GPTs or GPTs, that is generative pre-trained transformers or general purpose technologies. You know, asking what large language models are going to do to transform the economy right now, it's a little bit like asking Watt while they're pumping water out of uh, mines in, in the UK, um, what's the steam engine going to do to uh, the world economy? There's a lot that can change. I don't think that it means the job apocalypse is coming by any means. And, you know, the press reports that all these jobs are going away, you know, more would have to change on the technology side for us to get to that point. And that would be Peter's condition that you'd have to be able to replace the whole job at once. Instead, it really looks like these technologies are well suited to augmenting our knowledge workers and making them much more powerful than before. So um, that's what I'm really excited about. And uh, I'm looking forward to discussing more with you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience, please post your questions in Q&A. Uh, I'll try to organize them uh, into groups and present to the uh, panelists. For now, let's start with some questions that were raised uh, in advance while we were preparing this uh, panel. What my takeaway from this initial presentations is that basically we are still dealing with a moving target. A lot of things might happen over time. And um, if we take Daniel's uh, point kind of as the last statement in this regard, uh, let's go back and Manav, would you like to comment on this from your perspective, uh, how this exposure might play out? Do you see something else that over time might have to take place in order to for events to develop one way or another? No, I, I think I'm I'm largely in line with you know the the ideas that Peter and Daniel are talking about. I think the interesting thing, you know, when we're thinking about this J curve that you know Daniel mentions is in some ways, figuring out what are the complementary investments needed to unlock the potential of this technology. And, you know, that, that's something that I've thought about and, and written a bit before over the past. And it's a challenge because the technology is changing quite rapidly at this point. So to, I, I think that is one of the challenges, you know, I, th I think one of the things, Valeria, you mentioned is perhaps that we'd be addressing here is, you know, what can organizations be doing or thinking about? I think one of the challenges is trying to understand what is complementary um, to AI right now and how firms can, one, identify those things and then to invest in them in a manner such that they're able to kind of take advantage of when that J-curve does take off. Thank you. Uh, Peter, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, you are muted right now. Um, I think um, Manav makes a, a good point um, about thinking about how people could learn how to use generative AI in these jobs where there's a lot of potential to use it. And so, you know, there's a lot of discussion about people being retrained, but I, th I think when they say that, they're thinking you're going to have to be retrained to do something different. And I don't think that's true, but I think figuring out how to use this technology well is not so obvious yet. And that is, I wouldn't rush out and try to find a course that's going to teach you how to use this yet, because as Valeri says, it's changing so quickly. Uh, and also um, because we haven't really had enough time to figure out how you might actually use it. But figuring out how to use it well is going to take uh, some time. Uh, actually, Daniel, going back to your point, you referred, you did not mention any other technologies, what we know from the history, but overall, usually a new technology emerges, job implications and productivity implications take a lot of time to kind of figure out and for, to materialize. Can you give a recent kind of reference points what, which technologies had this kind of J-curve pattern and uh, where are we now with those and how much time might it take 
for this new oh, way to play. I out. mean, my my favorite two examples of this are are, are a bit older. So there's uh, Paul David's wonderful paper on the on the Dynamo. Um, you know, you had steam engines in the middle of the the room for factories and they kind of powered all these uh, offshoot machines. And then when the electric uh, power came, they put a giant generator in the middle of the room and just replaced the steam power. And you got a little bit of productivity gain out of that, but it wasn't until they figured out, oh, hey, let's modularize these electric engines and have them power all the different machines separately. That's where the gain stuck. And that took, or the gain showed up and that took like 30 years. Um, you know, as another long-term example, uh, there's a great paper by Feigenbaum and Gross about how AT&T took 90 years to roll out uh, automated switchboard operation. Um, now, switchboard operator is still a job, believe it or not. There's only one job that's been automated in the post-war era. That's elevator operator. So um, history is on certainly on the side of the um, folks who, who say that you know jobs aren't all going away. So that's uh, the first thing. But to respond directly to your question, like where are we with respect to, you say, the the J curve with computer hardware, right? So um, with the uh, slowdown of Moore's law, we saw investment in computer hardware and related intangibles slow down. But from about um, 1990 through to 2006, 2007, you saw this drag on productivity growth from additional intangible investment needing to go into implementing new computer hardware. Now that's that's pretty much over and we're starting to see the the uptick part where computer hardware actually contributes to productivity growth um, a little bit more than you know you might have expected. Otherwise, computer software, on the other hand, still, if you look at the graph, is like down and to the right. That is, we've got this um, this negative drag on measured productivity growth, even though the, the if you include intangible assets, that vanishes. Um, so lots of different types of technologies um, with different uh, deployment cycles, I think, the way I'd interpret that is IT has shifted from being a hardware-based um, business into a software-based business in, in their last decade or two. Thank you. Yeah, so we kind of identified a few uh, reasons why now it might be difficult to uh, kind of gain productivity from these technologies. One is that basically uh, it seems like even when we use uh, large language models or other generative AI, um, we create more work, for example, to verify the output, right? Uh, hallucination, we know hallucinations uh, are a major problem, uh, good for innovation sometimes, right, to hallucinate. But in general, when you need to be sure that you're getting some factually valid information and so on, it might be a problem. Uh, also training these models. Uh, does anyone can comment on, uh, will we need some human input into these models going forward in perpetuity, basically, right? Because if you imagine, like uh, Musk argues that at some point we don't need humans to do any jobs at all, where will these models get more data and kind of enough information to keep producing something relevant to people? Or will people become completely irrelevant? So any thoughts about, uh, do we need hu human input uh, and human skill to maintain rather than just, okay, if it can be automated, forget about it. Like uh, with uh, all these mapping tools, right? We don't orient ourselves in the city anymore by using a physical map. So what's going to happen in this area? What do you think? Who yeah, would like to Larry, I think uh, it's an interesting opportunity for librarians, actually, you know, um, because they're basically experts on data and text and where it is. Um, and understanding what's junky and what's credible. Um, and that is what, at the moment, we have to do in order to build these models and make them sensible, right? Um, so I, I think in the short term, there's a lot of human tasks here um, and a lot of judgment tasks. I, you know, as we, you know, I think I'm particularly concerned about the possibility of conflicting um, reports. That is, you ask the same prompt and you get different reports on something fundamental and somebody has to adjudicate that. And it's, you know, it's not unlike trying to differentiate expert witness testimony. Uh, and that's a pretty hard thing to, to do. Uh, so I think at the, at the moment, the judgment issues are huge. And I think there's a lot of higher level labor that's required to make these, uh, these things work 
well, and it's going to be quite a while until we figure out where they're going to be most useful. And this, again, I think the simple way to think about this is the mere fact that LLMs can do something doesn't mean that they will do it, right? And if it's the cost issues, it's the effectiveness issues. Uh, I was going to uh, think about another example here, back to your earlier questions about where we've seen this before. If you think about word processing, right? Word processing did wipe out typists pretty quickly, but it didn't really eliminate secretaries because secretaries had lots of other tasks. Secretaries did disappear, but it had nothing to do with uh, word processing and computer power. It had to do with management decisions. And that is the apparent ability to push those tasks off onto regular managers to do as well. So there's a lot of things that affect whether jobs will come and go and how they will be structured that have nothing to do with productivity and nothing to do with technology. Thank you. We have uh, another question from the audience. It's Dan Finley. Uh, Daniel mentioned the opportunity to combine AI with other solutions. Where do you see the greatest value for these combinations? How will the context and quality of the data accelerate progress? For example, integrating AI with an ERP application provides data with structured business context for the data and the ability to take action and automate resulting business decisions. Uh, Daniel, could you comment on this since you mentioned? Yeah, sure. So we're seeing, I think, two things um, in the early going are, are the, the key leaders in terms of complementary um, uh, innovations in software. Uh, the first is fine tuning, um, where you take an existing uh, language model and you have your own data for your own context, right? And you um, update some of the weights in that model to be more appropriate for the context. So that helps uh, get better answers very quickly in a, in a fine domain that makes it brittle to, to uh, context outside. Um, the other type of software that's really helpful, or a software approach, I should say, is uh, retrieval, retrieval augmented generation. So you have a database of documents, could be hundreds or thousands of documents that have truthful content. And when you, um, when you ask, when you query a large language model, it, it has to reference some of those, uh, those documents or it looks up uh, ground truth in those documents. And that's tremendously helpful from like a, a knowledge graph perspective within a firm. like. You know, if I'm looking for information in my employee handbook, you know, what am I allowed to do with respect to X, Y, or Z? You can ask a large language model that's got retrieval augmented generation um, with the employee handbook as, as a reference. Now, you still have to be responsible for the outputs there, but that helps to deal with some of these, uh, you know, hallucination problems that people have. There's yeah, so many more things to come, but we don't know yet, you know. Thank you. So basically the point is that... Um, a good quality data with some ground truth, right? When we know the valid answers can help customize these models for organizations, right? So that's where this, I guess, ERP systems come in because they have pretty much structure to organize data. Uh, thank you. Uh, so any other thoughts on this question? Uh, well, then maybe the last five minutes or so, can we talk about uh, more general kind of uh, possible actions and in policy implications of these technologies, if there are any, something that today organizations, uh, government, other agencies can do in this area. And maybe we already saw some action, for example, on the side of trade unions, right? So uh, please, uh, Peter, would you like to start or say? You're muted again. I think the efforts to restrict it uh, don't seem to ever work particularly well. Restricting it particularly because of the assumption that it's going to eliminate jobs. I think with visual media, it is a different issue because the copyright issues are already profound and the copyright law is already there. And, uh, you know, the extent to which um, chat GBT or, or Dolly or one of the others can zip through a bunch of images which are copywritten and lift them off and create something uh, which is in some legal sense new uh, is troubling. Um, and, you know, that is troubling because it undermines the intellectual property traditions that we've already got. So I think on that one, 
it's pretty important to do something. It's pretty important to try to do something about deep fakes, but as we're reading now, there's some debate about whether it's possible to do anything about that. But if not, of course, it's extremely troubling, right? That you just can't believe images because here's just a modest prediction that during the presidential campaign that will come up, we'll see lots of weird deep fakes. Uh, I imagine we'll see President Biden and former President Trump in bikinis, um, lots of weird things all the time, right? So uh, that is troubling. I don't know what to do about that, but I think we ought to worry about that one first and foremost. Thank you. Uh, Manav, do you have any? Thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think you know, as Peter mentions this, I, I think the idea of kind of visual or generated content and intellectual property is incredibly challenging to wrap your head around, you know, what, what is doable and, you know, what is ethical is, I think, you know, a challenge that I don't envy regulators to sort out. Um, I mean, some of the stuff that you can see created by some of the tools, even the early versions of the tools are uh, quite convincing. I, I feel like I, you can sometimes find, you know, uh, the similes of kind of I, I I'm a I listen to hip hop music for example. There's like a Drake generated AI song that you know if you listen to it, it's generally nearly indistinguishable, right? And so that there's a, I think a challenge you know that's coming up there. I agree with Peter Stake though that regulating these things more broadly in terms of the progress is is unlikely to be you know a helpful path forward. And I. I think especially given that this is becoming a competition on kind of a global scale where different countries are, you know, pushing towards this this tool that I I suspect that there will not be a lot of traction there. I guess the other the other point you raised, aside from kind of the policy implications, Larry, was just, you know, what what can organizations and you know people be doing to prepare? This is probably, you know, perhaps too simple of a point to even make on this webinar, but I'll go ahead and make it anyway. I, I think one thing that people should do is use the tools a lot, right? Like to understand them well. And I think you know, to kind of playing around with these things, figuring out, you know, where are they deficient? What can we use them? Like Daniel's saying, put them to work on grading, perhaps not put them to work on your boss's memo, like Peter is saying, right? And the the best way to get a grasp of that and to understand where these the state of the art is, is to use it. So uh, my my takeaway would be encouragement to use those things, you know, frequently and often. Thank you. Well, I hope we uh, kind of reduce some anxiety um, around this kind of job implications of uh, generative AI. Uh, that's probably the main takeaway from our conversation today. Thank you very much to all the panelists uh, and thank you to the audience for being here. Uh, there are plenty of topics to discuss going forward to we'll continue these interactions. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Okay, I guess we're all leaving. <laughs> Bye, Thank you, Peter. Bye. <laughs> Thank you very much.